Welcome everybody to this um, first webinar from uh, Pinnacle in uh, partnership with Mobile Health Solutions. Murray, you're a, 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 cardio and a clinical nurse specialist in cardiology and um, the, um, started in Auckland um, a, a little while ago um, and then and are now in Christchurch. And, and um, tell us a little bit about how you got there. Yeah, so I guess it's one of those roles where that I uh, fell into in terms of my love for cardiology. I uh, fell into it. I didn't necessarily plan it. So uh, I postgraduate moved to Auckland when I did uh, intensive care there for a few years. And then I got into research in Auckland. And the, one of the risks with research is that funding can always run out. And it did. So my funding for research... Uh, ran out and I had about four weeks to get another job and they were advertising at Green Lane Hospital in the cath lab and uh, all I could say to them was that I'd seen an angiogram somewhere in my past and that was enough to get me a job in the cath lab so that was my <laughs> cardiology really um, and I, I guess I have found my passion in cardiology um, mm -hmm. and within cardiology I've worked in the cath lab I've done nurse educator role bit of more research and now I'm in the nurse specialist role and I guess I'm in my dream role. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to your presentation tonight because um, this is an area that I know I need um, a, a lot of um, updating on. So, And there's been a lot of um, quite significant changes uh, uh, open to us and to, to help to support our patients. So um, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So when I was asked to talk about uh, cardiology, I thought of uh, topics that would be applicable to you as GPs. Uh, so things that you, uh, conditions that you see frequently in your practice. And one of them is aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis, and, and how do you manage that? Uh, and importantly, when should you refer to a cardiologist uh, and I know there are barriers to, to that with overworked cardiology um, specialties, but uh, sort of how do you manage this group of people? I also wanted to share with you a new treatment that we have for severe aortic stenosis, and that's catheter-based or percutaneous-based um, replacement of aortic valve, and that may well be new to some of you. So I wanted to just share a little bit uh, with with that and, and the latest in research. Um, I also thought that heart failure is a good topic that you're all faced with. You probably see heart failure every day in your practices and it's not very often new medicines come along in the management of heart failure but we have got a new medicine so I thought I'd just share a little bit um, about that and also acute coronary syndrome heart attack that's sort of interesting and exciting and uh, just update you with a couple of new things where we're heading for that. Let's get underway. So as we said, we're going to talk a little bit about aortic stenosis. Um, how do you know if your patients are becoming symptomatic with aortic stenosis? How do you uh, refer them and when should you refer them? Maybe I'll just touch a little bit on, on echo reports because there's a lot of things in echo reports that are like another language, aren't they? And, and, and what does it mean? What, what are the important things to get out of an echo report? Absolutely. So, yes. Sorry. Yep. No, that's all good. Yep. And then I, because it's one of my uh, special interests, I wanted to share with you the percutaneous approach for uh, aortic stenosis. We'll have a wee look at heart failure. And we love changing classifications with things. So we'll just touch briefly on a new classification for heart failure. What, what the new drugs are, and just a, what, what sort of new in, in, in the world of heart attacks and acute coronary syndrome. So that's where we are, we're heading. So aortic stenosis, tight, narrow aortic valve. And we're, what we say to our patients is it's like a, a, a stiff old gate that won't open. And a, a gate that won't open, it, it makes it harder for the heart, harder for the left ventricle to pump against a stiff, narrow valve, stiff narrow gate. Um, and I guess it starts off as a process that's just thickening of the valve initially and then that progresses to uh, become more calcium. And it's the calcium that makes it a stiff, creaky old uh, gate 
or, or valve. And this is what aortic stenosis looks like. Uh, all this cauliflower type material is actually calcium and it's the calcium that stiffens the valve and ultimately contributes to the symptoms that you see in, in, in patients when they present to you. So narrow the valve, the harder the heart has, has to work. And you know what happens? When the heart has to work harder, day after day, the heart dilates and enlarges. So the left ventricle dilates and enlarges. So not only do you have a problem with aortic stenosis, but then you end up with heart failure as well. And a lot of our patients present with acute heart failure and they may be coming to your practice to your surgery with symptoms of heart failure so shortness of breath but when the symptoms are investigated what it is is aortic stenosis that's causing it so sometimes presentation to you as a gp is heart failure but what's driving it what's causing it is is valve disease and an aortic valve so i Aortic valve stenosis is the most common valve problem out of all the four valves we've got. So uh, if, if you're going to take a punt, uh, statistically, aortic valve stenosis is the most common valve to cause heart failure. So what sorry, what sorry to interrupt. Um, all right, we just had a question um, why, about why does the calcium build up? Yes, so perfect timing for this. So in fact, the slide that we're just on now is what causes this calcium buildup. So excellent question, excellent, excellent question. So in most people, it's old age or older age. And so we, we call that fibrocalcific degeneration. So as we age, we get a buildup of calcium, we get it inside the artery. So the same process is what causes coronary artery disease. There's calcium in, inside the coronary arteries. And for some people, uh, it deposits on the, on, on the valve. So really older age is the most common reason. Sometimes the valve can be destroyed by infection and that can be rheumatic fever. And you'll see a lot of that on the east coast of, of the North Island um, and up Northland. Uh, sometimes it can be due to endocarditis, and that can be due to poor dental um, health. It can be due to IV drug use. So uh, definitely a, a group of people where infection is, is the driver uh, for valve disease. But in terms of calcium, um, it's older age. You, you will see younger people with us in your practice. And the people that are younger, it's usually a congenital cause. And when I say a congenital cause, it'll be people that have only two cusps to their aortic valve. So normally we should have three valve cusps, three, valve, three leaflets. Uh, so the group of people that only have two, we call it bicuspid valve and for whatever reason uh, and I don't think we really understand it those valves become narrowed earlier in life so these are the group of people that have a valve replacement in, in their 30s or 40s possibly 50s so it definitely does come earlier for this group of people Sometimes it's also related to other conditions uh, like Marfan syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. So that um, it, it can be uh, due to that in addition. But definitely when you look at the incidence and the prevalence, once uh, people hit their 70s, 80s, this is really takes off in terms of, of, of incidence. And the reason for that, as we've said, is calcium buildup. So another really good question is, why do some people just get calcium on the valve? Why do some people get it just in their coronary arteries? And why do some people get it in both? And, you know, we actually don't know the answer to that. Um, why some people end up having valve replacement and bypass surgery? Why do people just get, some people get one or the other um, affected? So uh, there's a lot we, we don't know. Um, 
I guess what we see in clinical practice, though, is that this process of narrow inducer calcium buildup takes a number of years, and patients can be asymptomatic with this process uh, for a number of, of years. Uh, but eventually, it, it does cause symptoms if it becomes severe enough. In the early stages, the symptoms can often be interpreted as the effects of aging. So some of the common symptoms are fatigue, shortness of breath, the inability to exercise um, to the same extent. And, and those things happen as, as we get older, um, and especially as patients get into their 70s and 80s. Uh, fatigue is a common one. When, who feels tired now at the end of your working day? Um, you don't have to be old to feel fatigued. But I guess the, some of the red flags are when that shortness of breath and that fatigue is accompanied by other symptoms of dizziness, feeling faint, especially on exercise, uh, presyncope and, 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 and syncope, uh, and chest pain, chest tightness are the other symptoms that, that cause us concern in terms of being red flags. So when, when you've talked to a patient in, the, in your surgery, um, sometimes you might think they've got no symptoms. Um, but just be careful because sometimes being breathless isn't necessarily part of getting older and getting more frail. So if your patient does describe breathlessness, what we'd encourage you to do is have a listen to heart sounds, because if it's accompanied by a murmur, then you've actually got symptomatic aortic stenosis. Um, and then that gives you license to refer to cardiology. Mm. So, there's a, so there's a couple of questions around, um, uh, you know, the one around how early do you pick up a congenital bicuspid valve? Is that something that can be, um, you know, picked up through you know, a, a heart murmur um, uh, in, a, in a child um, is one of the, is that a potential um, Potentially, yeah. yeah. But otherwise, you know, would it um, influence their exercise tolerance? Yes, definitely, yes. So that, that tends to be reduced. Um, and I guess it would be those two things in a younger person that would prompt you to refer to cardiology, refer for an echo. Yeah. The, and then um, is there a, a way of differentiating the cardiac causes of breathlessness from respiratory causes of breathlessness? Particularly yes, an elderly person. Very, very good question, Joe. The best way of differentiating is with a BNP blood tests. So a B-type natriuretic peptide. So it's really, really difficult when you've got someone in your surgery to know whether this is lungs or heart. And BNP has been shown to be an independent uh, marker. So if you do a BNP, if you're going to do one blood test, it would be a BNP level. And that'll tell you whether it's heart or lungs. So BNP's got a very strong negative predictive uh, value. So if it comes back normal, then you can eliminate cardiac quite safely. Yeah, good, good, good question. Yeah, wasn't mine. No, yeah, well done. Yeah, and remember, you can you can of course do a BNP level. It's not like an echo which sort of gets screened. Um, you can definitely order a, a BNP. Yeah, yeah, cool. So these are the the three red flags. Um, so a sad story, S for syncope, A for angina, D for dyspnea. These are your red flags of severe aortic stenosis. So not. All of your patients will have all of them, but once you start getting a couple of red flags together, uh, definitely you should be referring to, to cardiology. So um, I actually haven't put blood tests here, have I? But patient history is really, really important. Um, heart auscultation, important, and, and echo. Uh, so maybe for a GP surgery, we should replace BNP rather than, than, than echo in terms of things that, that you can do. In, in your surgery, but referral to, to, to echo. 
So I, I see there's a, a question. So if BNP is negative and your patient's got sh shorter breath uh, symptoms, I, I think there's still good reason to uh, refer for an echo, especially if you've heard a murmur. So if you listen for a murmur and your patient's short of breath, that alone is, is grounds for referral for an, an echo. So I'm not sure what your access to echo is like uh, where you are, but I know in Christ, yeah, Christchurch it's really bad too. Um, I was talking to a director of cardiology today and he says that they would screen out your uh, our referrals here in Christchurch. But if you had a younger patient, and even with a, a normal BNP, if you heard a murmur and they were short of breath, a younger person would be more likely to get an, an echo. So definitely in a younger person, um, hopefully you'll, you'll get access to an echo. What he did say is that if they decline, and, and echo, they will uh, give uh, guidance. They will give uh, recommendations in terms of how to how to manage that person. So they might say no to an echo, but they'll they'll, they'll still give you guidance. So hopefully that applies uh, in in Waikato region, Midlands area. But um, yeah, yeah, we're certainly um, keen to hear if uh, people are unhappy with the responses they get from the referrals. So yeah, the, they can yes. they, people can email me, and I can try and help to to. Yes, um, be a mediator. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I probably don't need to say much about listening for a murmur, except that, 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 that they, they can be difficult, can't they? The, the, the grading of, of a cat purring is, is about sort of grade three. So if you can hear your cat purring, that's about grade uh, three at, at, a, at a six. Um, that they are difficult. They are difficult. And remember uh, to hear in aortic murmur better or an S2 murmur, just get your patient to, to lean forward. That's the little trick. Um, I, I'm no expert at heart murmurs, so the things that help me uh, are to sit your patient forward and also just to get your patient hold their breath. That, that takes away the breathing noise. So um, beyond that, I, I'm no expert. Um, you probably listen to heart sounds a lot more than, than, than I do. Um, so if you've heard a murmur, these are probably the things just to explore in your history a little bit more. Uh, so ask questions about chest pain, chest discomfort, um, re revisit the, the, the history in terms of shortness of breath, ask about syncope or dizziness, um, ask about fatigue. Um, so with fatigue, we say without cardiac symptoms, it's less likely to be valve disease, but if you've got cardiac symptoms, then fatigue becomes important. It becomes then a cardiac symptom. So sort of a difficult symptom to get your head around a little bit, but if there are other cardiac symptoms in the history, then we say fatigue is a, is a cardiac symptom, and that adds weight to getting your echo done that, that you want. Um, and also explore history around cardiac disease like uh, rheumatic fever, potential heart failure, congenital heart disease. So heart failure, like we've said, uh, a BNP will, will add weight um, to any referral if you've got a raised BNP. So just some little tips in terms of, of getting your um, um, echo done. So key points, have a listen. If you hear a significant murmur, refer. So monitoring, um, I suppose we monitor frequently mild to moderate aortic stenosis until such point as patients develop symptoms. So in terms of echo parameters, what, what's mild, moderate and, and severe? Um, anyone with a significant murmur should be referred for an echo. And remember we said, if you wanna add a bit of weight to your referral, uh, get a BNP done, and if it's elevated, that'll definitely uh, add weight to your referral. Other tips to fast track an, an echo request. So if you put on your request that, that you've heard a murmur, uh, really 
careful history taking around symptoms. Do an ECG if you've got hypertrophy. Uh, so a, a, a big a QRS complex, especially in your chest leads, that adds weight to your referral. Um, and like we said, BNP is an independent marker of, of heart failure. So just some other little uh, tips in terms of, of things to add to your echo referral to, to help get it done. So you'll be familiar with seeing echo reports like this being sent through. So what are the key things that we look at? So the, the key things from a echo report is the pressure gradient. It's the speed of the heart flow, which we call velocity, and it's the aortic valve area. So I thought I might just take just a quick little walk through these three things. Uh, so if you're not familiar with them, then it just gives you a little bit of understanding what we're looking at in terms of mild moderate and severe in a echo report. So yeah, so there's a, there's a question come through uh, about a significant murmur. So yeah, significant murmur absolutely would be grade three or louder. So for you to be able to hear it, uh, that, that, that's definitely a significant murmur. So like we said, grade three would be a murmur that you can hear uh, relatively easily. And if you can hear it relatively easy, uh, easy then it's significant. And yeah, absolutely, the, the loudness uh, usually relates to the severity of, of aortic stenosis, yeah. So I'm intrigued about all those different numbers. Um... Right, yes. I think, yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to cut through them and we're going to focus on really what constitutes severe. Oh, yeah. So I've put a little red circle around here what's severe for aortic valve area, mean gradient, and, 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 and the speed. So these are really the only numbers that uh, are important in terms of intervention. So once people uh, hit these numbers, then that's when we start seriously looking at an intervention, whether it's surgery or, or an alternative. So uh, these, these numbers were sort of new to me a, a few years ago. So um, how I think of it, and hopefully this is helpful for you, is aortic valvaria is the size of the opening of the aortic valve. So normally we should have an aortic valve area that opens to about the size of a 50 cent piece. So that's normal. So as the valve gets, gradually gets tighter and narrower, mild aortic stenosis, maybe we should think of like a 10 cent piece. So it's a bit shorter, a little bit smaller, but there's still a, a quite a bit of blood flow going through it. Once it gets down to the size of a 5 cent piece, you're probably dealing with moderate and once you get down to a one cent piece, we don't use one cent pieces now in our currency, but that's the equivalent of severe aortic stenosis. So that same volume of blood has to get through the size of an opening of a one cent piece compared to a 50 cent piece. So a one cent piece in terms of echo parameters is less than one centimeter square. That's lovely analogy. I love that. And yes, I, yeah, it makes really, sense. Thank you so much. I, I really like the um, pushing at a stiff gate um, yes. as well, because a lot of my patients will, will that resonates with them. Yes, uh, and it's yeah. all about yeah easy terms to explain, and and you can explain to patients too about the difference between a fifty cent piece, twenty, ten, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a, a picture for the mind. Yeah, I don't understand anything complicated so all you're going to hear me talk about this evening is simple simple things so i'm just sharing my simple knowledge so the other thing that then influences why people go into heart failure is this pressure difference and when with you a tight aortic valve the pressure in the left ventricle is is much higher than the pressure in the aorta so the left ventricle has to generate much higher pressures push that volume of blood through and that's what we call the pressure gradient and what constitutes high or severe pressure is anything above 
40 milligrams of mercury um, on, on, as measured on ECHO. So that's what we're measuring is the strength of that push. And remember, if the left ventricle has to keep this up for too long, that's why people present with, with heart failure. It's the sustained pressure. The, the, the last um, echo parameter that we look at is velocity of blood. And velocity is all to do with speed. And I guess that's the, the, the amazing thing with, with echo is that we can measure all of these things just in, in, in 10 minutes. So for me, uh, velocity of blood is a little bit like if, if you went down the road on your way home tonight, and you were on a two-lane road, and that road had to merge to one lane, what happens is the traffic slows down. And you slow down in your car because it's safe to do that. Imagine what would happen if everyone sped up. But, but what, in, in fact, in order to keep the flow of traffic going, we should actually speed up shouldn't we, when, when, when the lanes merge, but we don't because it's road safety. But what the heart does, it's got this ability to recognize, hey, I've got to pump through a more narrow area. So what I'm gonna do is pump harder and we're gonna speed up the flow of blood. And as the blood flow speeds up, that's how the heart or the left ventricle compensates for an increasing narrow aortic valve area. So we can measure the speed of blood increasing and we've got parameters for severe aortic stenosis. So aortic valvarium, the size of the opening, the pressure gradient where the heart's left ventricle is pushing harder to get the same volume of cardiac output out and, and velocity where the heart increases the flow of blood are all ways that the heart uh, compensates and the, these are the three important things that we measure on, on ECHO. The, the other aspect that's, of course, really uh, important to us is how does the poor old heart muscle cope with this? So the ejection fraction or pump function is really important. And one of the things that motivates us to actually uh, treat people is when pump function starts to go down. That's when we realize that we need to do something fast in terms of, of, of interven intervention. There's a really good web-based GP education um, initiative that has just been launched um, recently, and it's an Australian website, and they are also getting the equivalent for New Zealand also. So for this web-based GP education, they've interviewed a number of cardiologists, um, and they've also interviewed myself. I've been interviewed and I talk about some of the aspects of uh, working people up for a spontaneous approach to intervention. So it's all about education for GPs in terms of managing uh, aortic stenosis. So take a note of this uh, website. Um, when we talk to you next, we might have a, a New Zealand-based um, website too, but this is designed especially for GPs, the uh, people that uh, initiated this are Edwards, and Edwards are a company that make uh, artificial heart valves for our patients. So wonderful resources. So do explore it. Uh, so it's run by Connect the Docs, um, and they're in the process of constructing a New Zealand um, site. But it's a go-to education tool for all GPs to find out more about all heart conditions, including aortic stenosis, and also to work out who your closest cardiologists are in your area. So this is fairly new. It's only been um, opened uh, maybe within the last month um, so that they're adding to it um, all, all, all the time. And I'm sure it will be appropriate for nurse practitioners as well. It'd yes, be level, yeah. definitely, yes. Anything that's at GP level is perfect for nurse practitioners. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to skip past this. Um, it, the, probably the two things just to remember, if you've got patients that have got severe aortic stenosis, uh, is just be really cautious with GCN spray because it does uh, drop the blood pressure, of course. And if you have a vasovagal episode due to low pressure, it just takes a bit longer for patients to um, re recover from that. So we advise that patients with severe aortic stenosis, if they do have GTN spray, spray it onto the hand 
and, and lick it off. You get half a dose. The other thing that uh, often worries us is um, when we see people from pre-admission for heart interventions and they're still driving, uh, the, the Land Transport Authority says that if patients have got a um, diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis, they probably shouldn't be driving um, because of the risk of, of, of collapse. But um, a number of elderly people do, so we sort of just have to suggest they maybe don't drive uh, very far and absolutely minimise the driving, but just to be aware of that's where the Land Transport Authority Agency sit for. Um, so this is a real area of, of, of can, you know, uh, difficulty for us uh, communicating to our patients the, the yes. ability to drive and it's so important to people um, but at yes. the end of the day you know it's something we've got to face really. Yes and especially with rural areas too how do you say yes. you know that, that's their independence isn't it yeah. really? But so you know it's, yeah. You, it's it, yeah it's got to we've got to, we've got to address it I don't think we can yes. we can it's one of those things we have to it's a professional responsibility that we have to, to save people Yes, um, absolutely. Anyway. Yes. So the um, the slides will be available um, afterwards. Um, yes, absolutely. Yes, I'm happy to give the, uh, the whole talk, or I've done a sort of an abbreviated handout version. Um, I just wanted to just introduce the concept of replacing an aortic valve without doing uh, open surgery. And we call that transcatheter aortic valve implantation. TAVI is the abbreviation. So we go from the femoral artery in the groin and we feed the catheter up the aorta over the arch and then we blow a balloon up and that expands a brand new aortic valve. And so this aortic valve gets embedded on top of the existing aortic valve. And so the big, what's the big benefit in this? People avoid open surgery. And so for elderly people especially, uh, they don't have to recover from open surgery. You know, the big benefit is we say to patients, or the, some of the big benefits are the majority of people go home the next day. So the majority of patients discharge the next day. And we say to patients that their recovery period is two weeks. So after two weeks, they can go back right to normal activity. If you've had a patient that's had open cardiac surgery, the recovery period usually is about sort of six weeks, isn't it? Six to eight weeks. So two weeks is the recovery period from, from TAVI. This is revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary. So is the um, heart so beating whilst, that's, whilst you're doing that? Yeah, yeah, really good question. So we do this with the heart beating, and we also do it, uh, we do it with an anaesthetist, but we do it with conscious sedation. So we've found out that it's good to avoid general anaesthetic. So these people are, are sedated, we give them pain relief, but they're essentially awake. The, the worst part, if you like, is we, when we blow the valve up, we rapidly pace the heart to drop the blood pressure, so there's no resistance to the valve going up. Patients briefly feel dizzy, but apart from that, they tolerate it perfectly fine. It's amazing. So avoiding general an anaesthetic also improves the um, recovery time. This is amazing. Um, I'm just going to zip through. You know, if, if we didn't fix aortic stenosis, 50% of patients die within a two-year period, and that's worse than many of the cancers that you see in, in your surgery. Uh, and that's why, yes, we, um, we, we believe we should um, fix it. Um, up until recently, the health department have said that we should really only do this on high-risk uh, surgical cases. Um, and we've had, we have a heart team that sort of uh, selects which patients are appropriate for this and, and which aren't. We look at red flags. We weigh up risk. I'm just going to scoot through this. Um, I guess we have to work out who's too frail for this and who would be suitable. Um, so we have a few frailty uh, tests. You know, I, I, as part of the pre-admission, I do a wee bit of basic frailty and cognitive testing. One of the things that we get the patients to do is do a clock face. 
And it's amazing the amount of patients that can't put the numbers around the clock. If, if you ever sort of have doubts about your cognitive uh, ability of your patients, this is something that you can do in your surgery. Give them a circle, get them to write the, the numbers of the clock, get them to put in 10 past 11. Um, I suppose it's something that we, we learn to do when we're young and as our cognitive ability declines, we, we lose it. So this is just one aspect. It's not pass or fail. Um, so uh, in terms of the question, you say Waikato Hospital, we do this in, in terms of your region. Waikato do a TAVI. Uh, Auckland do it. Wellington do it. Christchurch and Dunedin. So you, you would feed into the uh, Waikato region here. Um, in terms of the workup, we do echo, we do an angiogram because if people have got significant periartery disease, then sometimes they're better to have combined uh, bypass and valve surgery. CT gives us amazing pictures. We have to make sure that the peripheries are wide enough um, to get our equipment up. Don't you love these CT pictures? They're fascinating. Yeah. Uh, wonderful technology. Uh, we get a really close look at the aortic valve and the specific measurements that, that we look at. We do respiratory function testing, dental check. Um, the valves that we use are bovine pericardium, so from beef, cows. We have a, a range of, of um, sizes, four different sizes. Um, so is there uh, any benefit at all then for open surgery um, is the question and, and um, if, if, if not why not a tabby for all yes. um, is it you know do they is it it must be cheaper to do it this way than open surgery I would imagine yeah. in terms of the procedure absolutely and, so and do, they, does, do they last as long um, you know does it have yes. the same sort of prognosis afterwards very good question so the one thing we don't know is durability compared to a surgical valve. So that with the surgery valves, we've got data out to 10 to 15 years, and we can say that on average, a surgical valve will last you know, 12 years or so. We don't have that same data with TAVI because the research is only out to about seven years. Yeah. And that's predominantly why we started doing it in an elderly cohort, because we say, well, if we get 10 years, that they're probably they're doing good. Mm. Um, so that's the one thing we don't have, uh, but we do have data on cost, uh, and it is very cost effective. So compared with high risk, um, that the research says that it uh, results in similar outcomes. So that's high risk surgical cases. Um, so that's it's uh, exciting, but the surgeons, of course, say that uh, we don't have long term data, and that's exactly right. But where it gets exciting is that this research out with intermediate risk uh, just a couple of years ago, and compared to surgery, death and stroke, and that's the things that we all worry about, uh, is significantly less compared to surgery. And this is where it gets even more and more exciting. Um, so, uh, Southern Cross private insurance coverage for intermediate. You know, in um, March this year, there's been two randomised controlled trials that came out in low-risk surgical patients. And this is what I really wanted to share with you. And it relates to the uh, last question, what's the benefit of open surgery? So this was the, the summary that TAVI was superior to surgery with regard to death, stroke, and rehospitalization at one year surgical patients. That is so exciting. So if you had to have uh, a, a valve intervention, a TAVI is superior compared to surgery. So the only thing we do know is the longevity. Um, so that's the only thing that we don't know about. The other problem that we have is that we are not resourced at this stage to do larger numbers of TAVI and low risk people. So we, we have to increase our, our resources. So uh, also better was less atrial fibrillation, less hospital length of stay, better, better outcomes really. So uh, TAVI and low risk and intermediate risk is definitely superior. Um, we, 
yeah, this is the way of the future. But we just need a bit more money and do it. So these are all the things that are better. Uh, length, the length of stay post heavy is down to one to two days. Our patients only stay for a few hours in CCU. Um, and, and volumes, of course, are, are, are on the increase. So the future of TAVI is looking really bright uh, for both intermediate and low-risk patients. Uh, so, you seen in the, uh, so I think, I think um, so there's a question there about is um, AF being a common um, complication of aortic stenosis. I think it's a complication of the surgical intervention. Is that, is it that is. right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a much higher... Uh, incidence of complication following open surgery compared to to TAVI. Yeah, so yeah, we we see very little of it following TAVI. Um, I, I suppose a, a atrial fibrillation also goes hand in hand with heart failure, doesn't it? Of course, and, and a lot of these people have heart failure, but definitely worse um, after open surgery. So and what's Mick Jagger doing there? Sorry, Murray. Yeah, so Mick Jagger had um, a TAVI recently. Oh. Um, yeah, should we, where are we? I can't, uh, here we go back. So, Jagger had heart surgery, it was quoted in the media, but in fact, he had uh, TAVI. And there was a, a little clip on uh, TV recently, it showed him dancing. And I can guarantee he wouldn't have been able to do this if he had had open surgery uh, compared to, to, to TAVI. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's nothing ever, ever is risk free. Uh, and there are risks associated with TAVI, but those risks are less than open surgery. So stroke is less. Um, and I guess we've learned that sometimes doing less is, is better. So no central line, no catheters, no GA, no prolonged bed rest. It works better for people. It absolutely works better for people. Yeah. Um, so you will see these people coming through. Um, one day you will have a patient that's had TAVI done. And in terms of uh, looking after them in the community, um, we, we just say look after the groin sites, avoid heavy lifting, avoid strenuous exercise for two weeks. After that, you can get back to normal. If, if the groin site looks a bit infected, go to the GP. Um, otherwise, we say no driving for two weeks. That's sort of our local rules. Um, otherwise, everything's back to normal in two weeks. Are they on an anticoagulant regime afterwards? Really good question, Joe. So um, we, the recommendation worldwide is that people are on aspirin. Um, so it's only an antiplatelet agent. So we used to say aspirin and clopidogrel. Uh, there's research to suggest that that's not necessary. So if people aren't on aspirin, we put them on aspirin lifelong. Uh, but certainly no need for an, an anticoagulant like uh, um warfarin and or dibigotran. So aspirin only uh, is the only change to medicines that we make. So watch out for the tsunami. So I really need to talk just a few minutes about heart failure because I promised I'd uh, talk a wee bit about heart failure. Um, a new way of classifying it is according to echo results. And we still talk about right and left heart failure, and we still talk about systolic and diastolic heart failure, but the, the, the new classification is by ejection fraction. And remember, ejection fraction is the amount of blood pumped out in one beat expressed as a fraction, and normal should be a, around sort of 50 to, to, to 60. So there's two groups of people now. So every one of your patients that you see in your practice is either HEF, REF, so they've got heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, so that's less than 40, um, or someone with an ejection fraction above 50, and they're called HEF, PEF. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or, or reduced ejection fraction. So that's sort of the new terms that you'll read in literature. I guess the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is the equivalent of our systolic heart failure, and the hef -PEF is the equivalent of the diastolic heart failure. So diastolic heart failure, or hef -PEF is where the heart can't relax, and if it can't relax, it can't fill, and if it can't fill, cardiac output goes down, whereas hef -REF is a pump problem, isn't it? So the, in terms of endocarditis prophylaxis, we still 
do recommend, and I know this is sort of starting to change a little bit, if people have dental surgery, uh, they should have the usual dental prophylaxis. So we should treat it the same as any other heart valve. So uh, you're absolutely right. It's just like a stent. It's a, a, it's a fancy stent, isn't it? Um, and so the, the bovine valve is a, a fancy stent. But in terms of a dental prophylaxis, uh, we, we recommend that the current um, guidelines are apply for, for, for TAVI. And, and that's sort of in a wee bit of a state of flux, isn't it, really? Um, but I, I think we certainly would recommend that there is some dental prophylaxis currently. If you look at all your heart failure patients, about half are hef reef and about half are hef pef. So these people are um, all, all over the place. And here, here's an echo report just to prove that these people uh, exist. So if you look at the ejection fraction here in this person, it's absolutely normal. It's, it's really high. It's 79%. So this person has got really good pump function. But when you look down here, it says severe diastolic dysfunction so this person was admitted with heart failure and their problem wasn't the ability of the heart to pump they've got really good pump function but the problem was the ability of the heart muscle to relax and fill so this is a hef pef echo so why, why, why is this important um, because we're going to talk about a new heart failure medicine which is indicated for hef ref patients. This is probably, if we could look inside our HEF pa PEF patients, this is probably what it looks like. There's sometimes too much muscle, and when there's too much muscle, so this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you get um, too much muscle. This is why the heart muscle can't relax, um, and, and people get into strife with heart failure. Mm. So it's interesting with with um, HEF PEF, um, it often seems to affect older females, and it's a real mixture of comorbidity. There's high blood pressure, there's obesity, there's atrial fibrillation, diabetes, and it all combines to form this HEF PEF type of heart failure. There's no one single um, factor really, but but the difficulty is. We actually don't know how to treat it. And all the research trials on heart failure have been done in HEF ref patients, not HEF PEF patients, because anyone with a normal ejection fraction has been excluded uh, from the heart failure trials. So it's really worrying, but we have no evidence based therapies for HEF PEF. And, and, and the new medicine I'm going to share with you next is really for hef ref it's, it's not for hef pef um so in 2019 so sorry you're saying that 50 so for 50 percent of our patients that are with heart symptomatic heart failure have hef pef mm -hmm. and yes. for those people there's no benefit from ace inhibitors no people don't get the same benefit from ace inhibitors and beta blockers as our hef ref patients so all we can offer them like these are our, our latest guidelines here all we can really do is give them diuretics and help manage comorbidities. So keep blood pressure under control, AF, diabetes. So it's a pretty grim outlook, isn't it? So if, if, if your patients have had a echo and you know they've got hef pef, uh, you may not see the same response uh, with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers that we traditionally see with hef ref. You would still use them, though, presumably. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But it doesn't seem to improve mortality um, yeah. to the same degree. Yes, yeah, so we've got nothing else to, 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 to do. So, yeah, definitely use them, but um, you might be disappointed. Yeah. yeah. And if there's a question about weight loss in these patients. Would that be particularly helpful at all? Or um, Yes, perhaps? definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I suppose the weight loss particularly... Uh, helps also for the comorbidities also so yeah. diabetes and, and atrial fibrillation one of the biggest things that we are, are finding that helps 
reduce the incidence or the frequency of atrial fibrillation is weight loss. So a 10% uh, weight loss equates to about a 6% improvement in, in the time that people spend in sinus rhythm. So very, very good question. So there's definite benefit um, from uh, re losing weight for this hef hef group of patients primarily uh, for the, the comal management of comorbidities. Yeah, it's a really good question. So it might just spend maybe five minutes on the new heart failure medicine uh, and five minutes on, on ACS. I'm conscious I don't want to go too much over the hour for, for people, uh, but the extra information will be in the, in the handout. So like we said, there's not very often new medicines come along with heart failure, but this is a, a brand new first-in-class angiotensin receptor uh, nephrolysin inhibitor. So it's called Interesto, and it's sort of two components of it. I'm just gonna flip through some of these things. Really, really exciting research um, around it, um, which I'm gonna whiz through. So it reduced hospitalization, it reduced Death, this is compared to enalapril. Um, so reduced sudden cardiac death, improved quality of life. Uh, and, and you can have a look at these things later when, when I send it through. Um, so in terms of what you need to know as a GP, let's just focus on, on that really. So it's an angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor, which sort of contains two aspects. So the acetabitrol, uh, which is a nebrilicin inhibitor, and the valsartan, which is your angiotensin receptor blockade. So the, the first component, sacubitritol, sort of enhances the body's natriuretic peptide response. So it, it enhances the body's compensatory mechanism on one hand, and then on the other, the valsartan, Aside, it helps block the angiotensin um, cycle, which is where you get your vasoconstriction and your aldosterone. So, sort of helps the joint and it blocks the bad, all in the one um, medicine. So, it's indicated for your HEF ref patients. Um, and so, typically, I suppose if you've got a patient with class two or three, um, HEF ref and they're currently taking an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic and maybe a beta blocker uh, and, 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 and there's no improvement in symptoms, then consider uh, uh, interestero for this. So there's three dose strengths and what they recommend is that you start on the mid range, so that's 49 milligrams and 51 milligrams, and then after two to four weeks, step up to a target dose. So the only thing is you do need a 36 hour sort of washout period when switching from a ACE inhibitor, so they've got to come off their ACE, wait 36 hours, and then start on this mid range. Um, and then if things are going okay, primarily in terms of blood pressure and renal function, so similar things to monitor as an ACE inhibitor, then you can step up to target dose. There is a low dose, um, and these are the group of people that they recommend that you start on low dose. So if people have never been on an ACE inhibitor before, if they're a little bit older, if they've got renal impairment, or moderate hepatic impairment. So start on low dose for that group of people, wait two to four weeks if everything's going okay with renal function, blood pressure, step up to mid range, and if everything's still going okay, go up to target uh, dose after two to four weeks. So three dose ranges um, with, with a, a target dose. Um, So, of course, not to take it with an ARB because it already is an ARB. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. So otherwise, you'd be double dosing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the caution with starting, if you didn't wait 36 hours, then you're more at risk of some of the side effects like angioedema. Um, so the, the washout period is, is to reduce side effects from that. There um, is special authority. Um, 
which you can apply for. Uh, so the big things that we've seen are low blood pressure. So hypotension is definitely something to monitor for. Uh, and I suppose a little bit similar to your ACE inhibitors, uh, just watch renal function, watch potassium, um, and people can get a, a, a cough or so. Uh, so if any of those things happen, you can juggle other medicines. So you could juggle a diuretic dose, potentially a beta blocker dose, dose. otherwise just step back. So you could go to low dose um, interesto rather than, um, yeah, rather than fiddling with, with, with other things. So there are options. So just for us, the across the Midlands region, um, there won't be a, an updated health pathway um, uh, relating to this. Um, there may be it may be accessible. Um, you may have the the baseline pathway, which has not been localized, um, with a, it's got a little sort of cone on the top of it. But that's okay. We can you know it's still got the relevant uh, medical information there. The other resource that we've got um, for practices is um, Dynamed Plus. Um, and there are um, really good guideline links on there um, for um, uh, for entresto use. Um, the, if you um, people got any uh, questions about how to access that, I can um, I can email that out. Um, but it's that's free for all clinicians across the Midlands region. So, um, but yeah, that's that's fantastic. It's fantastic to have a new option um, for for these patients. You know, these are basically the patients that are on maximum dose of other medications, and um, and this can you know give them a, a you know a, a little sort of further improvement in their quality of life for for a little bit longer, um, as well as um, uh, you know decrease it, it, it improve the length of their life. I understand. Yes, absolutely. I thought I'd actually put into my talk, I borrowed um, a copy of the Health Pathways from Wellington. Yes. Uh, so I do have a copy of the Health Pathways if you would like me to send it to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yes. it'd be really good. I mean, uh, as I say, we, we do see the Health Pathways, um, uh, but they're uh, um, uh, it's a bit confusing. They're sort of, um, uh, they have this not localised yet um, sort of um, sure. thing. Yes. Yeah, I thought I'd actually put it in my talk, but I, I don't think I have, but I can definitely send it to you, yeah. So, and and, and Marika's uh, asking about um, when would we recommend starting using the Entresto, um, and I, as I understand it, it's, um, uh, it is that, you know, you've, you've used an ACE inhibitor, and you've, you're on the beta blocker, you're on the diuretic, yes. you're on pretty much maximum doses of those, and yes. you're still in strife. That's yes. when the, um, according to the guidelines, that's when, or the um, special authority, that's when you can use this medication. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes. So that when they, they do suggest you could start someone on who hasn't been on an ACE inhibitor, but I think um, that the easiest is, is to do it for people that are symptomatic despite being on ACE beta blocker diuretics. Yeah. yeah. So the when you're in that situation, again, there's another question about spironolactone and its role in cardiac and in, in, in heart failure. Um, when when would you add in the spironolactone uh, into a, a, a regime for someone with heart failure? Yeah, so probably if you're getting up in dosages with diuretics, yeah. uh, and, and, and I guess the potassium... Um, ability to, to keep up with potassium loss is an issue. So bigger doses definitely of, of, of diuretic. And if you've got a patient where it's difficult to maintain uh, potassium levels. I, in fact, I had to skip past a few little slides um, earlier. That there is actually a new uh, alternative uh, to spirolactone too that's also come out. Um, that's yes. a, a potassium sparing uh, diuretic. Where are we? So epilepharone. Um, and once, so once again, this is a new medicine in heart failure, particularly good for patients that um, have got renal impairment and you're worried about potassium monitoring. A little bit more selective than spironolactone. So, so would you use this as a instead of in that situation instead of spironolactone, you would you would normally go for a plenarone? Yes. Yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, it's uh, definitely 
available. So uh, both of these new medicines are, are in guidelines now, heart failure guidelines. So yeah, either or. Yeah. So um, just for two minutes, I just wanted to share a interesting study uh, that challenges some of our traditional beliefs with beta blockers post MI. Uh, there was a study that was done a couple of years ago uh, where it looked at patients that were post MI and that didn't have heart failure. And they found that beta blockers wasn't associated with uh, any sort of benefit in mortality. So but what does that tell you? It probably tells you that if you've got a patient post MI and they haven't got heart failure, they, they haven't got a reduced ejection fraction, that maybe beta blockers aren't as important as we've maybe um, considered them to. So if you had a patient and they weren't tolerating beta blockers um, and, and they didn't have heart failure, maybe they're not quite as important as, as, we, as we think. We probably need a, a few more studies to confirm it, but it's interesting to me because sometimes, as you know, you get up against it and you think, well, should, am I okay to reduce this? Am I okay to stop it? I, yeah, I think that's probably an answer. Yeah, patients are often asking, you know, they've got, they've come out with five different medications and, you know, do yes. I have to take all of these? And, yeah, uh, um, you know, that, that gives us a bit of an option for thinking about which ones to stop or to allow them yes. to stop. Yeah, so I think it sort of gives you license to consider stopping mm. that. The other thing um, I just wanted to share with you is that if you've got a patient who's having an MI, in your uh, uh, surgery, or they've got ischemic symptoms, um, there's been evidence to suggest that we shouldn't give oxygen in the setting of acute MI. Uh, there's been a, a nation New, or New Zealand-wide study that the results are about to come out shortly in September, actually, um, which will help answer the question more for us. But definitely where we sit is that oxygen has no benefit and potentially it may cause harm. So if you've got a patient and you suspect cardiac ischemia, there's no need to put oxygen on. Uh, we, we have a, a cutoff of about, about 90%, uh, but certainly sort of 92, 93, don't put on oxygen if they're maintaining stats around that. Well, we've known the danger of giving oxygen to neonates. For many years, we, we sort of taught Mona, didn't we? But we have to put a big cross over oxygen. So. Um, these results are due out very shortly. I know they've um, uh, the St John's Ambulance um, have changed their protocols around this as well. Um, yes. So, they, they, um, uh, so if you're in the back of an ambulance with the ambulance officer who's refusing to put oxygen on your patient, then um, you know they are they are doing the right thing. Absolutely. Yes. They're certainly um, they're, they're, they're preventing. Uh, um, probably, yeah, they're certainly not, yeah, they're not withholding anything. So I think that's probably enough. Um, I'm happy to take any, any questions as, as we wind up, um, anything that we've glossed over. Uh, as I say, I will send through the uh, version of this for you just to read some of the finer details that we've sort of probably glossed over just due to time. But there was, um, uh, um, so the, yeah, I think that was a fascinating um, presentation, and, and um, you know, I I love the, um, the the little tips and tricks you gave around how to explain these things to patients, uh, in particular, because um, you know the uh, often it's that uh, if we can draw an analogy for people, and um, if we can put them in a, in a, a visual way, way that they can understand, if the the more they understand about their condition, the more they understand the medic the medications, the more likely they are to concur. Um, yes. In, with advice, and um, you know that's uh, that's really Absolutely. really good. Yes, but yeah, you're right at the the, the front of it. You see these patients, and, and you're the ones that um, refer them on. And I, I wish we could have better access to to echo and things like that in terms of management of heart failure and aortic stenosis. Yeah. But, um, well done. Yeah. You, so um, just sort of see if there's any other um, questions coming through online. Um, but um, the um, I've certainly um, uh, I liked the uh, the idea of sort of being able to add weight to the echo referral um, through being um, you know providing uh, 
you know, information, have you heard a murmur, what are the symptoms, yes. adding in the ECG, chest X-ray and BNP. Um, yes. You know, the um, we've got to give enough information for the for a priority to be placed. Um, you know, if if it's you know simply you know murmur, please see. Um, you know, it's the, those we can understand how difficult it is to to make a decision about those sorts of um, uh, referral um, uh, referral letters. And um, the other thing I was um, uh, particularly uh, intrigued in in your slide at the beginning was the huff ref and the huff puff uh, in the title thing. So I now I now understand what they what they mean. In, yes. So, Mm. Same group of patients that you've been looking after, but we just put new terminology on them, don't we? It's <laughs> funny. So had, when referring in for a discussion about, um, from Anne-Marie Anne about, mm -hmm. about um, reasons on an echo to refer to cardiology, so when you see the echo report, um, when do you refer on to cardiology? Yes, so the, uh, the th anyone with severe aortic stenosis criteria mm. uh, and even people that were moderate with symptoms but usually so somewhere sort of between moderate to severe patients will start uh, developing symptoms so definitely those three key um, per, uh, aspects so the aortic valve area the, the mean gradient and, and, and to a lesser extent, the velocity. But even if you can remember the, the valve area of um, one less centimeter. one centimetre, if yeah. you can remember a mean gradient of greater than 40 milligrams of, of mercury, um, those are the key uh, aspects to, to that will determine a, a referral to, to yeah. cardiology. And the velocity, um, you said it, the, the heart compensates and rather than slowing down as we might expect with the narrowing, it actually decompensates in some way to, yes. in, to increase the speed. And the, yes. the velocity that would indicate severe heart yes, failure? Yes, absolutely, yes. So uh, the, the, as the vol velocity increases, that correlates with the severity of the aortic stenosis. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that, um, I, I guess should be a red flag in terms of cardiology referral would be low ejection fraction too. Yeah. So uh, in terms of looking at causes for that, um, because a low ejection fraction can be reflective of ischemic heart disease or it could be reflective of a valve disorder. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I suppose once you get sort of into moderately impaired uh, yeah, I, th I think that's another group of people that you need also a bit of advice on also. So the hiff puff patients, the people with um, preserved ejection fraction, um, they would, would they have a, um, a high velocity and a high pressure gradient? Is that, or are that yes. sorry, aortic stenosis? Yes, so that's more the aortic stenosis yeah. aspect. So they could, that they, what will just, Distinguish them on an echo report as a normal ejection fraction, but with the clinical signs and symptoms of, of heart failure. Right. So they've got an elevated BNP, um, yes. edema, they've got um, yes. you know, swollen ankles, breathless at night, and then they've got yes. a um, preserved ejection fraction. Yes. Um, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, so in the past we might have looked at them and thought, well, how can you possibly have heart failure? Because, you know, you, you, your pump function is, is okay. Yeah. But these still present with acute heart failure. They right. can present with pulmonary edema, uh, the full spectrum. Yeah. In addition, they may well also have valve disease, but yeah. that's probably yeah. another... But, okay, so that's a separate thing. Yeah. Separate, yes, yeah. The... Um, uh, so um, the patients uh, Anne's asking, so patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, mm -hmm. we don't have to refer to cardiology, or we we should. Um, um, I think that I mean these are a difficult group of people to yeah. to, to manage, um, and I, I think 
Yeah, I think they, you should still refer them to, to cardiology. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you will manage them, um, their initial management with the medicines that you would start people on. Uh, but I think if, if you're struggling um, to get any symptomatic improvement, you should definitely refer. Uh, so although mortality might be harder to influence, you still need access to cardiology the same as a as a hef ref patient so e even if we haven't got a lot of um, evidence-based medicines maybe it's even even more reason why you should be referring on yeah. um, to people yeah. so yeah definitely still re refer yeah, to, to, to cardiology yeah well murray thank you so much for your presentation it's really enlightening i the um your uh it was you the way that you described it was very understandable, even for a bear, a very little brain like myself. And um, the, I'm sure that the um, people who uh, joined in will agree with me that. Um, and 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 thank you so much indeed for for giving your giving your time. Um, thank you very very much, Joe. Thank you for all the participants too. We really really appreciate you taking this time at the end of your day.